Let's have a look. We continue our series on following Jesus. One of the big thoughts from uh, last Sunday, um, as we looked at what it was like to be a disciple 2,000 years ago, was the tremendous privilege, the tremendous privilege of being a disciple. Only a handful of people in Israel ever got to be a disciple of a rabbi. It was the opportunity of a lifetime. And so what we said is how much more so are you and I privileged to be Jesus' disciples today? Especially for the fact that we didn't have to be the best of the best of the best to be able to be his disciple, and we didn't have to convince him as a rabbi and say, please let me be your disciple, all right? He chose us. He calls us. It's a beautiful thing. Praise God for that. I believe it's the greatest invitation in the universe. Amen? I really do. So, I, um, just before, I'm just noticing this. He's going to move that as well. There we go. All the drips. So, uh, I found this quote by Dallas Willard. He said, no one goes sadly, reluctantly into discipleship with Jesus. As he said, no one who looks back after putting his hand to the plow is suited to the kingdom of God. Luke 9 verse 62. No one goes in bemoaning the cost. They understand the opportunity. And one of the things that has most obstructed the path of discipleship in our Christian culture today is this idea that it will be a terribly difficult thing that will certainly ruin your life. <laughs> I like the way that's put, okay? Perhaps there's one person here today who really needs to hear that. You see, friends, yes, we do count the cost of following Jesus. He didn't promise a bed of roses. It will be challenging. There will be challenging times. We know this. But we don't bemoan the cost, and we certainly don't go in thinking that discipleship is going to ruin our lives. Amen. Amen. Yes, that's better. All right, okay. So we accept Jesus' invitation with joy because we recognize that we gain so much more than whatever it is we have to give up. Becoming a disciple of Jesus won't ruin your life. It won't slightly improve your life. It will be new life, abundant life, the best life that we can ever live here on earth. Do you believe that today? I really hope that you do. It is something to be joyous about. Cool. So today we're going to move on to speak about mentorship, mentorship, and uh, we're going to look at the role that we can play um, together as we grow together as disciples of Jesus. So he has an important statement just to begin with, and it's this. You'll see it behind me. So when it comes to people growing as disciples of Jesus, you and I have a vitally important part to play, but we can never replace Jesus. Those are both true. We have a vitally important part to play, but we can never take the place of Jesus as the disciple, the rabbi, the teacher. All right, now justice will be clearer and clearer as we move forward. So we looked at this passage last Sunday. Mark chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. It says of Jesus, He appointed 12 that they might be with Him and that they might send Him out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So remember we said the first goal of a disciple of any rabbi, but especially a disciple of Jesus, is to be with Him. Okay, so before all the ministry stuff, before the preaching, the deliverance, their first goal was to be with him. And 2,000 years later, that's still our number one goal. The first thing is that we would be with him. And Dallas Willard says this. He says, But if I am to be someone's apprentice, there is, only, there is one absolute essential condition. I must be with that person. If I am Jesus' disciple, that means I am with him to learn from him how to be like him. All right. So in our home groups this week, we uh, spoke about Apprenticeships, we try to remember, those of us who had some practical training, what it was like. Remember how, how you felt you were drowning? Hey, you felt like you knew nothing. You felt like you were so out of your depth. And so the thing is, though, you needed to be with a person mentoring you. If you were going to be, let's say, apprenticing to be a motor mechanic, you'd need to be in the workshop. You'd need to be around your mentor, watching what they did, observing that they could then direct you, show you the ropes, and, and correct you as you were trying to do things yourself. It's a no-brainer. We've got to be with the person mentoring us. And so, of course, as we said last Sunday, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. We are on earth. But 2,000 years later, we can still be with Him. Huh? It's your part. The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, absolutely. The Holy Spirit, who is exactly the same as Jesus. The person of the Spirit is in us, and He is with us. And so this, being with Jesus today, we do via the Holy Spirit. It is life with the Spirit, life in the Spirit. This is how we are with Him 2,000 years later in 2024. So let's have a look today at um, discipling, okay, as it were, and especially the role we can play 
when it comes to others being discipled. So the Great Commission, Matthew 28 verse 19, contains these words. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. We've got it there as well. There, you that chair. Disciple the nations. That's kind of the end goal. That's why we're still here. Okay? You'll see it up there. So, um, I don't know about your church background, but many of us have grown up in a church background with a strong emphasis on the need to make disciples. All right? Um, certainly, that was my part uh, growing up. Um, well, not so much the, yeah, more late on, I'd say. The church I joined late on, very strong on this. And it's something I've always had a desire to do. I'm sure there's some here today, too. You've had a desire to make disciples. For others, it can feel quite daunting. I go, oh, you know, can I do it? Do I have to do it? So those kind of questions. So here's the thing, though. When it comes to me making disciples, there actually are some challenges, all right? And I want to try and illustrate it for you today. So I'm going to ask for Jesus, Peter, James, and John. They were in the prayer meeting. I briefed them earlier. So Jesus, Peter, James, and John can come stand here. Maybe the camera will still pick you up. Hello to all those who are watching this later. Great to have you watching. So here we go. So... Let's have, um, okay, so Martin, you can say, you can be, uh, come, come, Eli. Martin can be my disciple. So I, I'm saying that jokingly. Martin, you're going to stand just to the side over here. Over here, just, no, here, here on there. There we go. I'm going to leave you right here, Martin, just for now. So gather around Jesus, these guys. It's Peter, James, and John. It's just because he's Johnny, Jesus, it kind of, you know, it's close. So there we go. So um, here we have, so obviously Jesus had another nine. We know that, and, and there were still others that followed. But if you look in Scripture, these were the guys who probably were with them more than anyone else. They got to see some things that even the other nine didn't get to see. So there's Jesus with his, okay? So now I'm told I'm a believer. I'm told I must make disciples, okay? Something, oh, okay, what do I do? So yeah, I see Martin, and we're going to pretend that Martin's a newer believer, just for the argument's sake, okay? So Martin, you want to come in a bit then? They should pick you up on camera or put you, yeah, Martin, next man. So now I see Martin's a newer believer. I think, okay, well, here's my chance, okay? So I say to Martin, Martin... Would you like me to disciple you? Inverted comments. Okay. Would you like me to disciple you? We can meet one and a half hours every week. We can talk. We can share. We can try and see you growing. And Martin's like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. All right? So we make this commitment. We are going to meet one and a half hours every week, one and a half hours every week. And we're going to be on this discipling journey together. Now, first thing is that's not a bad commitment. For many people, one and a half hours every week, that would seem like a bit of a push in this busy world we live in, not so? So most would say applaud, so that's, that's pretty impressive, okay? So yeah, I've got my one and a half hours in terms of discipling, but over here, friends, and let me just make sure I've got the right number in my head still. I do remember it, yes. Okay, so there were times where Jesus did go off by himself. There, if you look at it, there were probably some times when the disciples were in their own community, but there were often periods, friends, where for weeks, they would have been together 24-7. So there are 168 hours in the week. It means I've got my little one and a half hours over here with Martin. These guys had 168 hours every week, 24-7 with Jesus. How does this even compare? You see the first problem, okay? But it's not just a time thing. It's also what we get exposed to. So let's say I'm now with Martin. Okay, so now we have our coffee. Okay, now we get going. And so we talk life, and, and he can tell me things that he feels the Lord's showing him. I, I share as well. I can try and encourage him. I can try and help him. But I've got like an hour and a half to try and show him everything. Okay, these guys, 168 hours, teachings of Jesus, Q&A, so much more. But it's more than it. It's not simply the teaching is important as it is. It's also what they were exposed to. Over here, Martin never gets to observe my life. We get together for a coffee. He doesn't see how I react when someone cuts me off in traffic. Now, some of you are saying, thank the Lord for that. <laughs> we all works in progress. Yes, put your hands in confession time and you want me too. Okay. He doesn't see how I handle it when someone comes and asks me for money in the street. Or um, if someone offends me, how do I deal with that? Okay. He doesn't get to observe my life. Over here, these guys were with Jesus 24-7. They saw how he reacted when he was falsely accused. They saw how he reached out to the despised, the tax collector, the prostitute. Jesus was a living, breathing example of the very life that he was calling them to live. Friends, can you see the problem? Okay. For me to call this discipleship, can I be honest? It feels a bit phony. Okay. How does this discipleship can even compare to what discipleship looked like 2,000 years ago? Are you seeing it with me, friends? Are you seeing it? It's something I've often thought of, like it's troubled me a little bit before. And then years ago, I saw this picture. I'm going to show you now. Okay, so the answer is this can't compare to that, obviously, okay? And so even calling this, this big discipling relationship feels a bit 
phony, actually. Anyway, but what if we change the picture, okay? What if Martin come with me? Actually, Martin is over here. Jesus is his great disciple, okay? Jesus is his teacher. Jesus is his rabbi, okay? So that means Martin's high point of the week every week is not the one and a half hours that we spend together. No, no, no. He is following Jesus 24-7. It's life in the Spirit. He is growing of the Lord, moving forward in the Lord. And then what happens? I still have an important part to play, but now it's not all on me. So for one and a half hours of the week, I come and join him here as he's following Jesus. He tells me what's going on in his life, what he's learning from the Lord, what he's being challenged in. I share that with him too. I can be listening for things the Holy Spirit might be saying. I can hopefully answer questions he has, okay? And uh, I can be directing his thoughts and his heart towards the Lord. I'm encouraging him. I'm helping him. But I'm not trying to take the place of Jesus. I'm just walking alongside him as he is following Jesus. Does that make sense, friends? For me, that takes all the pressure off, really. So Jesus is discipling him. I'm coming alongside him, and I'm walking with him. And it can be what we're going to call a mentoring relationship where I'm helping him, but there's his disciple. This is his discipling relationship. Does that make sense? For me, I find that liberating. It takes all. It's like the same thing of saying, I must go and save souls. I can't save dip squad, friends. I can share the gospel. I can pray for people. Share my testimony. Only Jesus saves, okay, by the power of the Holy Spirit through the gospel as it goes out. Okay. Does that help? I hope it does. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Give them a little hand. Well done to Jesus and his disciples. <laughs> All right. Good. So, as I have a sip of water, someone might ask this. They might say, what about this scripture? 1 Corinthians. Have a look. 11, 1. And there we go. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's what Paul said, okay? So isn't there supposed to be a whole lot more of following us? So let me say this. Firstly, the apostle Paul himself called himself the chief of sinners. Paul would be the first to say that he wasn't perfect, okay? It's on the one side. But I want to say today, Paul was a legend. If you ask me to pick a guy other than Jesus in the New Testament, I'm picking Paul. Like was a legend, okay? He's probably one of the greatest disciples of Jesus who's ever lived. So I want to say, even in the church today, there are not many Christians who could say with the same authority and boldness, authenticity, follow my example. Would you agree with it, okay? But even so, okay, if we look at that, we have to ask the question, where's Paul placing the emphasis there? So if we can have the next one. Where's he placing? Is he saying, follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ? Or is it, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Where's the emphasis coming in? Okay? So think of Hebrews 12 verse 2. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Can you imagine Paul saying, no, 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 ladies and gentlemen, no, no, no. Don't fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on me. Look at me. Copy me. Follow me while I follow Jesus. Of course he's not saying that. He'd never be saying it. So even there, friends, it's always about Jesus. Okay? The emphasis is definitely on the following example. And yes, we hopefully will grow to be people where we can be good examples, especially to newer believers, those looking into the faith. We want to grow as examples, but Jesus is always the example. All right. And uh, as we, especially as leaders, hopefully we're setting some kind of example as we follow him. But again, the emphasis on Jesus. That makes sense. Okay. I hope so. Cool. So let's have a look at that statement again that we started with. Thank you, Leah. So, when it comes to people growing as disciples of Jesus, we've been saying we can never replace Jesus. All right? We can never replace Jesus. I trust that's established. But now let's have a look more at the vitally important role that we play in their growth. Because we do have a vitally important role to play. So, let's begin to look some more at that. All right? So, occasionally you hear a story of some remote village somewhere, like a village full of Muslim folk, where someone is miraculously saved. Maybe the Lord appears to them in a dream, or they hear like one of those radio broadcasts, they hear the gospel, and they're saved, and they are the only Christian in that whole town. Okay? Friends, that does happen, but that is the exception. It is very definitely an exception, not the rule. The Lord isn't looking for a kingdom of lone rangers. Okay? The Lord is not looking for a kingdom of lone rangers. So... God has created us to be relational beings with, for relationship with Him and for relationship with each other. We need Christian community. I'm going to say it to you again today. We need Christian community. One of the best ways for us to grow 
is to be firmly rooted, planted in the soil of Christian community. You know, friends, when you take believers out of community, when they are isolated, withdrawn on their own, okay, most of the time, this is what happens. Either they slow in their growth, they are not growing as quickly as they were anymore in the Lord, or they stall, they stop growing, or in some cases, they actually start going backwards, okay, they start losing the ground that they've taken, okay? We are not created to be on our own. We need fellowship with them, and then, of course, fellowship and relationship together. We need community. So much more I could say on this, but I want to look at this in the context of one-on-one -on -one relationships, okay? One-on-one -on -one relationships in Christian community. So here we go in the next slide. We are going to be, they sometimes called Paul and Timothy relationships. I'll explain in a moment. We're going to be calling them or referring to them as mentoring relationships. So if you think of Paul um, and Timothy, who was like, okay, now this is a strong one because Timothy was like a spiritual son to him. He really was. But of course, in our lives, we need Paul. So these are people um, so we're not, just to be captain obvious, not literally like the Apostle Paul with his level of maturity and expertise, okay? There are not too many of them on planet Earth today. Um, you're talking about someone who is further down the road than you in their maturity as a believer, in their growth in Christ, okay? And it's someone then who can encourage you and they can help you and they can speak into your life. They can mentor you. So Laurie and I over the years have had a number of people fulfilling that role for us of being Pauls in our lives, Especially in ministry, it's something we really, really need. Okay, so uh, we have Pauls, and then of course Timothy is. Um, you also need Timothys in your life as you grow and mature. So Timothy is someone where you are being like a Paul to them. You are mentoring them, speaking into their life, encouraging them. One of the best ways to keep growing strongly in your faith is to have Timothys around you that you are mentoring. Okay, that's such an exciting thing and important thing. So there's Paul and Timothy. Then there's another type of relationship which we sometimes call Paul and Barnabas relationships or Jonathan and David relationships. So yeah, you're talking about a strong friendship where the level of spiritual maturity is very similar, okay? So it's not a leader and someone they're leading. It's more friendship, okay? But it's also not a superficial thing, not just chatting about the weather, sport, whatever. You are actually holding each other accountable. You speak the truth in love. This is a friendship where you have each other's back, okay? We, we need those ones as well. Now, I want to say to you, we need all those relationships. So, especially if you are going through a challenging time in life, one of the great things is to have a, a Barnabas or a Jonathan in your corner, praying for you, rooting with you, walking with you. You know that we don't have time to look at the verse today. We often remember that David strengthened himself in the Lord. We sometimes forget there's another place where Jonathan helped David to find strength in the Lord. And that's what Jonathans can do. They can help you sometimes to find strength in the Lord when you are struggling, okay? We need Jonathans and Barnabases, but we also need our Pauls. We need our mentors. A mentor is someone who can help you to break open a ceiling, break open into new space, and to grow and advance in your walk with the Lord, your relationship with them, and in serving the Lord as well. We need Pauls. We need mentors, okay? These are so important, these relationships. So again, for clarity, we're saying that these Paul-Timothy relationships we are calling them mentoring relationships. But now, as I say that, I know someone might say, but Greg, I've been in the church 30, 40, 50 years. We've always used the word discipling, okay? So I'd say this to you. I hate squabbles over semantics, you know, words, terminology we use, okay? So if you want to call it discipling store, you can, but I would give these two big cautions to you in doing so. Firstly, remember that these people are meant to be with Jesus. Jesus is their disciple, all right? And, and our job is to constantly direct their eyes, their hearts, their mind to Jesus. That's the first one. The second one, they are never, ever, ever your disciples. They are Jesus' disciples, okay? Never your disciples. They are Jesus' disciples. If you ever see someone just chest puffed out, oh, there goes one of my disciples, just ask them two questions, two simple questions. Just say to them, did you ransom them from, from uh, sin and death by the shedding of your own blood. Question one. Question number two. Is the Holy Spirit trying to change them into you or trying to make them more like Jesus? Those two questions should sort out any confusion, deflate the pride pretty quickly, etc. All right? They are always, always, always Jesus' disciples, never our disciples. Cool. Amen. Good. So, having said that, let's shift the focus now to this mentoring program that we want to embark on. Here at the church, and again, I said this morning too, I hate using a word like program. It's not this project, this thing we got to do. 
But anyway, it's, you know, I can't really think of a better word for now. So it's KCI Mentoring Program. Okay, so you'll remember that um, a few weeks back, and actually we did it over a few weeks, you, um, most of you completed a little mentoring slip, and you said that you were either available to mentor someone in the basics, so to be a mentor, or uh, you felt you needed some mentoring when it came to the basics of our faith to be a mentee. That is actually a word, by the way. It's not a fancy little mint sweet or something. Mentee, M-E-N-T-E. It's the one who's mentored, okay? So it is legit. Anyway, uh, I even looked it up just to be sure, but yes, it is. So the group of mentors was bigger than the group of mentees, which is what you'd expect in a church, especially when it comes to the basics. So it should be our belief. Um, so what that means, friends, is that we are going to be assigning people who would like mentoring with mentors, but it means that because this group is bigger over here, not everyone here is going to have someone assigned to them, okay? Please, if you don't get someone now, don't think, oh, what, what's wrong with me? Don't they know how special I am? Does nobody love me? No, 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 don't listen to the lies coming from below. Nothing wrong with you. It's just in economic terms, supply exceeds demand, okay? That's simple, all right. But, but this is the exciting thing is that we are going to send the mentoring resources to every single person who put their hand up and said, I would like to be available to mentor someone in the basics. So even though you might not get someone now, you are ready to go. If the Lord puts someone in your heart, you can begin mentoring straight away. Okay, you don't need our permission or waiting for us to do something there. Secondly, over the coming weeks and months, perhaps there are some people who come forward or we might identify who say, I could benefit from some mentoring in the basics. I'd like some help. And then we can turn to that list. And those that didn't get names now, we can then ask them to help out. So, all right, so that makes sense. Trust it does. Cool. So if we talk about how this is going to work, the rollout, let me tell you what's going to happen in this coming week. So if you put your hand up to say, I would like to be mentored in the basics, you're going to get a message from the office. It's going to say something like this. Dear, put your name in. You completed a mentoring slip to say that you would like to be mentored in the basics of our faith. We are planning to ask name to go in, to mentor you. If you have any serious objection or concern to this person, please let us know immediately. Thanks, KCI office. That's what it's going to say. All right, so let me explain this to you, okay? Remember what it was like at school? So often at the start of the year, the teacher would decide who sat where, remember, okay? Sometimes you check the name, they, oh, I don't really want to sit next to this side. So you'd beg the teacher, please, ma'am, please do a reshuffle so you could have your mate come and sit next to you, all right? This is not that. This is not that. I really need to emphasize that. So the reality, friends, is in a church like this, there are some people sitting here who, to be honest, quite a few of you would say, yeah, I'd really like that person to be my mentor, but there's, it's not possible, okay? And so the thing is this, and I, I do want to say this too, is that in putting people together, we haven't just drawn names out of a hat, okay? Here's Mike, here's Bob, okay, you yeah? know, away you go. We prayed a number of times we prayed over this. We asked the Lord to direct us. This is intentional as well. We're trying to look at who we feel should be going together. We're not saying we got it perfectly right, but we're trying to give you an assurance. We didn't take this lightly, okay? We really prayed, really tried to see people coming together where this can, can be fruitful and, and even advantageous for both, okay? So this isn't swapping desks. I don't really want to emphasize this, but this is the thing is that um, you can't get your preferred mentor because they're probably already taken, just being blunt, okay? But what this is about is let's say we say we're going to put you with Bob, I always use Bob, Bob, and you get there and you think, oh no, you've got some serious history with Bob, something we don't know about, um, there's some issue, something that you feel would mean you couldn't ever really open up to Bob and trust Bob, and, not, and also would struggle to trust Bob to speak into your life, okay? Can I just say, if that's the case, you should really be dealing with that, you and Bob, okay, but anyway, you should. Um, so we're not expecting anything to happen, but if there's a situation like that, you just have to quickly get back to the office and say, please, if you don't mind, I'd rather ask for someone else to mentor me, okay? And then we'll get back to you. We'll see what we can do. But I'm not expecting, okay, I'm not expecting anything. Even we, like people have said, or we know they know each other, we've tried as much as we can to make this um, a connection that will work. All right, cool. So that'll happen this week. Then the week after, the week starting 28th October, uh, mentors, guys, I said, I'm available to mentor. You'll get a message saying, we would ask you to connect, contact this person whom you're going to mentor. We'll give you the name and the number. Uh, we're not going to do the whole check thing. We expect mentors to have more maturity um, than those being menteed, okay, mentored. Uh, but if there's, just to say this, if there's someone out there who gets a message and is like, oh, no, hang on, 
not this person, you better get all of this straight away, okay? But not expecting to get any issues. So mentors, if we can ask that you contact that person ASAP, they're going to be waiting to hear from you. So the first thing is to make contact, and the big priority is to make uh, a time, date, place for your first meeting. That first meeting is an important one. It's a relaxed one. In some cases, you already know the person, but it's a, a chance to get to know them more, get to know each other, get to know each other's stories, talk about expectations, talk about the way it's going to work, and especially how often you're going to meet. Okay, so that, that meeting will happen soonish then, obviously, as mentors contact those they're walking with, those things will be set up. I do want to speak about the thing of how often you should meet, okay? So keep in mind, yeah, keep in mind, we are not asking you to make a lifelong commitment to each other, okay? You're not marrying the person, so relax. Right, you're not going to have to wash their cars on weekends and mow their grass and that kind of stuff, all right? So anyway, the point is this, friends, um, we're asking you to commit to something for a season. It's actually a relatively short season. We think, it's hard to, get, because there's a number of factors that affect this, but we think the mentoring program we've got on the basics would run for three to six months. It's not this massive thing, you know, for years and years. It's, it's pretty short, actually, in the picture of life, okay? So in an ideal world, in an ideal world, you'd probably meet on a weekly basis. That would be great. But we know that for a lot of people, that's a challenge in this day and age we live in. Having said that, to meet once a month, that's going to be too infrequent. That's not often enough to get the most out of this. So we would recommend that you aim to meet at least once every two weeks for an hour to an hour and a half. You'll get the most out of it that way, okay? Or more, you'll get the most out of it probably on a weekly basis, but um, an hour to an hour and a half every two weeks, that's pretty good if you do that for six months. So um, I was working out again. So that's in, a, in two weeks, there are 336 hours. There we go. One to one and a half hours out of 336 hours every two weeks. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. Some of you aren't too sure yet. No, you can. Believe me, you can. All right? So that would be a suggestion in terms of how often you should meet. What we're going to cover, so there are materials we're going to be sending to the mentors. Okay, we're going to combine it in a PDF, in a, in a manual, a booklet that we'll send out so you don't have little bits and pieces of paper. We'll probably update that all the time. Um, but we are going to ask everyone to start out by working through this book. Here we go. The Ignite book. How many of you remember Ignite? How many of you did Ignite? Okay, so we launched Ignite, that's our new logo there, it looked a bit different, in fact I've actually got one half ripped apart that we had to use for PDF a while ago. We launched this over 13 years ago, would you believe it, here in KCR, it's quite amazing. So some of you were around for that, now where did it go, it was here, just give me a second, all those bits of paper, okay, here we go, that's it. So it used to look like this, you might remember our old Logo, that's what it looked like, okay? So that's Ignite. It was a resource of Common Ground Church in the Cape. They gave us permission to use it, and we could then adapt it to make it our own. So you'll find testimonies in here of people who either they're still in KCR or they certainly were in KCR. Okay, but that's, that's the Ignite book. So this is, as you can see there, it says a 31-day journey into the Bible for new believers and not yet believers. That's the great thing about it. It's a book that um, if you are new to the faith, it's great for the basics, okay? And also, it's a book for those who are not yet Christians. They're still looking into the faith. You can even take them through this book. It's very, very helpful for that, okay? So, um, and the thing is this, if you look at a daily reading, it would take, so basically there's 31 days. So let's say you aim for six days a week. Leave yourself a Sunday. If you miss a day, you can catch up kind of thing, all right? But six days a week, so here's day one. Um, it, this is such a user-friendly book. You remember, those of you who've done our um, church-wide campaigns, the books, the manuals are written by Terran Williams. As far as I remember, he wrote this. Very easy to work with, very user-friendly, well-written. So there will be a, a reflection piece, then there's a scripture passage, then you think it through, and then there's some apl application points. And if you're still hungry for more, there's some more scripture that you can read. You can do this in 10 to 15 minutes a day. Now, how many minutes do you have in the day? 1,440 minutes you have every day. We're asking you for 0.01% of your daily time to do the reading. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can do it. You can do it, muchachos. You can do it. All right. Yes, you can. So we will be sending more stuff to the mentors, 
but we'll, we'll communicate. I won't take up more time on that now. Okay, so you'll start with the Ignite book, and I will be communicating more with you on that. So I want to end off today with just, I'm going to call them seven C's for this mentoring time ahead. Okay, seven C's. Number one is going to be Christ. Number one has to be as Jesus. What we emphasize in the first half of this message is that the focus is always on Jesus. Our discipling relationship is with Jesus. He's your rabbi. He's your teacher. He is your disciple, okay? Always keep the focus on him. So when you meet, it's not about sitting down and talking sports, politics, etc. This is not a time to debate who the Nephilim might have been or whether it's pre, post, or mid-tribulation. That stuff is utterly irrelevant when it comes to the basics of our faith. That is not foundational stuff, okay? Later on, you can pick it up as you might grow and mature. But stick to the most important stuff, the basic stuff, and we're going to help you with resources for that. You know, um, in Luke's gospel account towards the end, we read of, obviously, after the resurrection, two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus joins them. Remember the story. They don't recognize him at first, but later as they reminisce, they say, weren't our hearts burning within us as he spoke with us? And that's all we're trusting for, friends, is that when mentor and mentee meet, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is the third and vital person to join that meeting and that your hearts would be burning. You'd be excited, alive in Christ as you talk together. All right, we're trusting for the life of God in those times. Number two is confidentiality, and this is so vitally important. You must agree on complete confidentiality. If you want to build trust so that you can be vulnerable, so that you can open up and share, you have to agree on confidentiality. And this is applies to both mentor and mentee. You cannot go home to your spouse that night and say, you won't believe what Bob told me today. Or you won't believe what Sue confessed, okay? No, you cannot even tell your spouse. You can't even tell your dog, okay? Confidentiality has to be, friends. It is vitally important. You have to have complete confidentiality. There is one exception that you must agree on, and it's this. Let's say that the, the person who's being mentored shares something, and the person who is mentoring them, because they're not some expert in all things, they think, yo, this is big. I don't know how to deal with this. They recognize, I can't just ignore it and move on. We need to try and help the person, but I don't know what to do. The mentor needs permission to then go to a leader they trust to get advice and perspective. Okay, this is necessary. Otherwise, you, you're not actually going to help with that issue. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is not a breach of confidentiality. This is something that's necessary to help the person who shared that thing. All right, that makes sense. You're all good. All right, number three, conversation. All right. This is for the mentors. The people that you are mentoring are not coming to sit and listen to a one to one and a half hour preach every time you get together. Right? This is important. For this to be effective, you need dialogue. You need conversation. Go and look at how often Jesus asks disciples questions. Okay? That's why this is so valuable because this mentoring is what can't happen here on a Sunday. I can't take Q&A from everybody. I'm, when I prepare, I'm trying to anticipate and answer questions that you might be asking but we can't have dialogue. You can't ask me questions. I can't question you. I do sometimes. I joke a bit, little questions. But the point is that's what a mentoring relationship and a small group, a home group is for, is that opportunity to dialogue, to have conversation together, okay? The mentee needs to be able to ask the questions that they want to ask. They need to have a voice. All right. Number four, care. Care over there, that's love spelt with a C. All right. So, um, there's the old saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You're not coming into some cold, impersonal lecture. This is a real life person, okay, that you, two of you interacting. And so we hope that over time there will be a friendship that grows, okay, and that you will care for each other. And so the mentees, this works both ways. So the person mentoring you will be praying for you. Why don't you ask them, what can I be praying for you? All right, works both ways. Number five courage. We need to have the attitude that no question is too silly to ask, okay? There's no topic that's too simple. You need, this is the place you can ask the questions that you want to ask. Have the courage to do so. Just, if you've got confidentiality, you can have the courage to be vulnerable even, and to be yourself. There's no pressure to impress the other person. Let's just take that off both ways, mentor and mentee. There's no pressure to perform, to impress, be yourself, okay? Um, you will only get out of this what you're willing to invest and put in. So have courage. Go for it. Number six is commitment. I think one of the worst things in life is when you start something, it starts with a bang, and it just fizzles out and is never completed. Okay? So as mentor and mentee, 
encourage you, commit to finish this journey. All right? It's important. And then when you make your times to meet, commit to be at those times, barring some big emergency, commit to be there and to be there on time because that honors each other as well. Commitment is important. And finally, coffee. So I was looking for a synonym for the word enjoy. Starts with a C. I came up with coffee because I really enjoy coffee. All right? So quite literally, it's good. When you get together, have some tea, have some coffee. Have a treat even sometimes. You know, Alpha, one of the reasons for the success of Alpha is actually the dinner table, actually that meal. It really does something. So maybe have a little bit of meal sometime. And the point is, I want you to enjoy this. Again, just like that Dallas Willard quote, don't go into this like, oh, no, I've got to do this thing, okay? Friends, I have found so much life and joy in times, mentoring times that I've been involved with and really going to trust that if you have the right attitude and if you go into this with a good heart, I believe you're going to find the joy of the Lord and the life of the Lord in those times, both the mentor and the mentee, okay? Um, they're so important. There's more you could add. One in the prayer meeting today, I was thinking about teachability, coachability. Anyway, have an attitude, have a heart to learn. And that applies to the mentor too. You, you'll be surprised how God grows you through this too. So it's going to be an exciting time. Enjoy it. I'm going to say this in conclusion. So we spoke about the importance today of Paul-Timothy relationships, which we are calling mentoring relationships. One of the problems in a church, or the challenge, not a problem, it's a challenge, is that very often mentors and mentees struggle to find each other. So the person's needing to be mentored, like, well, who do I speak to, and how do I do it? And sometimes the pe people who want to, they want all questions. Am I qualified? What am I going to say? You know, who do I approach? So what we're trying to do, it's something we felt God stir our hearts to do, which is try to kickstart this process by introducing people together and giving you some resources that you can use and to work with, all right? I'm not saying we're always going to do it this way, but you won't. But let's go for it, friends. And really what we are praying for is that through this, there would be this like this wave that builds, this wave of mentoring relationships in this church and through this church for years to come. Years to come. All right. We want to trust for that. So let's pray together as we finish off. Thank you. I have covered a bit of ground today, but need to get through this. And also going to encourage those who weren't here today to watch, especially those who are going to be part of the mentoring relationship so they know what's involved. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, thank you again. We want to we wanna go back to where we began. Thank you again for the awesome privilege of being invited by you to be your disciple. We again recognize that no human being, no church, no group of Christians can ever take your place as our disciple, especially as you disciple us through your word and especially through your Holy Spirit in us. Thank you for that, Lord. But thank you that as people, we have a vitally important role to play as we partner with you in this discipleship journey of people. And one of these things we've been looking at today is mentoring. And Father, I want to pray for these Paul and Timothy relationships to grow and to flourish in this church and through this church. Father, we dare to ask that this, we, even the word program, don't like using this, this word, we don't want this just to be this little project, this little thing we do for the next few months, and then it, that's it, over and done with. We want to pray, Lord, that you would stir our hearts, that we would find so much life and joy in this, that we almost couldn't wait for the next mentoring relationship. Those who are mentors, we pray they wouldn't just mentor one now, but many in the future. Those who have been mentored in the basics, we pray they will go on to take others through the basics and experience life and joy in doing so. We ask again, Lord, that this would be successful, this would be fruitful to your glory, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would cause it to work. So thank you now, Lord, even now it's a growing excitement um, for what lies ahead. We pray that we're going to find so much life in these mentoring times together. And we pray, Lord, for growing as your disciples, as ultimately we keep our eyes on you and follow you. We pray this confidently in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to end off today. Before we do, just let's pray something really important. There might be someone here today who has never begun the journey of not more than just coming to a church or following a man, but the journey of following Jesus. There is only one who can save you, and his name is Jesus. He lived the perfect life you could never live, and then he gave his life for you on the cross of Calvary to ransom you with his very own blood, to pay the price so that all your sin could be forgiven and that you could have everlasting life with God. 
There's only one way to the Father and to life with God. Life that begins now, you're on earth, and that's Jesus. He calls you now to follow Him as His disciple for the rest of your life. That's the call today. That's the invitation. If you want to respond to that today, I want you to pray this prayer. And let's all pray it out loud today again. I know last week battle. Pray this out loud. We're praying with, even if there's one person today who's praying this prayer from their heart, let's pray with them. And so let's pray this. Pray with me as we pray and say, Jesus Christ, I call on your name to save me. God, I confess that I've sinned against you. I ask you today to forgive me for all of my sin. Thank you, Jesus, that today I am cleansed, I am adopted into the family of God. I am a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. And from this day, Jesus, I will follow you. I, I repent. I turn from the life I've been living to follow you, Jesus. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Open your word, the Bible, to me. And give me grace to follow you, Jesus, all the days of my life. My life is yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, Lord. As we're in this place of prayer, just with heads bowed and eyes closed, I would love it if, if you prayed that prayer today. Would you raise your hand so I can witness with you anyone who prayed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we just thank you both here and perhaps later someone who might even be watching this online. We just thank you, Lord, for your amazing mercy and your grace. And Lord, I feel today as I look at these are recommitments that I'm recognizing them leave. And so, Lord, we pray today that you would even now grab hold of these hearts and, and Lord, that they would be undivided hearts. They would be hearts that are fully yours and that you would give grace and strength to follow you all the days of their lives. We thank you, Lord, for a greater measure of abundant life than these men have ever experienced before. We pray for that, that they would grow to know you more than ever before that their hearts and their lives would be fully surrendered to you. And Lord, that they would grow as your disciples, Jesus. We pray for this today. We commit them to you. We thank you for what you've done, Lord. And thank you again for your mercies that are new every morning. Thank you for your amazing grace that saves us. Thank you for this gift of salvation and this invitation to life with you, following you, growing to be like you. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And together we said amen and amen.